Hello, welcome to the monthly lecture series of the National Capillary Skeptics. I'm Scott Snell, the current president, live streaming from the Washington, D.C. area. The National Capillary Skeptics is a nonprofit educational and scientific membership organization that promotes critical thinking and scientific understanding. We've been hosting these monthly events free and open to the public since our founding 36 years ago this month. We'll be celebrating our 36th birthday with what we call a Skep Tour. Members, check your email inbox with the details that we sent you last night. We'll be exploring the DC Museum of Illusions. We have discount tickets and it will be April Fool's Day, a perfect time to explore that museum. Well, I mentioned that NCAS is turning 36. After all these years, I think this is our first event that you might call a book club meeting. And it's the ultimate book club meeting. Your friends and acquaintances show up and the author. How cool is that? The author is Lee McIntyre, a philosopher of science, research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University, and a recent lecturer in ethics at Harvard Extension School. He's author of several books, including our book club's focus today, how to talk to a science denier. Ladies and gentlemen, joining us from the Boston area, Dr. Lee McIntyre. Thank you so much. Thanks you both for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. I am, uh, would say, um, you know, that this, this book club meeting uh, concept I just described, it doesn't happen often where mm -hmm. uh, the book author shows up. For example, what if some folks are very critical of a book? What can those folks really say when the author's right there? Well, uh, that, that's the, the perfect occasion. I didn't know it was a book club selection. Thank you for, uh, sure. for doing and that. That's, I, I that's have terrific. quote marks around the word book club. But yeah, okay. my feeling is, um, you know, we can follow your book's advice about communicating civilly and so on. And, and, and I can speak for myself saying that won't be a problem because I love your book. And I love your Thank overall you. concept of not closing doors between people, keeping lines of respectful communication open. You know, in this time with social media, with blocking and unfriending, um, for what it's worth, I, I've never unfriended. I, I have a couple hundred. Uh, maybe that's the secret is not having thousands of Facebook friends, but I've never unfriended anyone. I, I will draw the line at someone who is... Um, you know, wants to uh, initiate violence, um, uh, you know, that that's right out, but I've never had to deal with that. Um, mm -hmm. um, I did want to ask you, uh, I noticed your book title is How to Talk to a Science Denier rather than How to Persuade a Science Denier. Right. You, that's part you know, of what you want. You are the first person ever to note that distinction. And I worked so hard to make that distinction. But I mean, I, I've done so many events where people blow right by that and, and you've picked up on the point. It's, it's how to talk. Talking is a necessary but not sufficient step to persuading. Um, and you know, when you do this, if you go in with the goal to persuade, that can put you in the wrong mindset. If your if your goal is to persuade somebody, then then they the conversation can be a little different, and they can even kind of tell a little bit, you know, why you're engaging in it. But if your goal is to talk, which means listening to them and they listen to you as well, uh, then then that can be effective. Thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. And I did want to touch on the aspect of. Um, if I remember correctly, and I, I have a few notes here in terms of um, that there is no empirical evidence of the efficacy of face-to-face -face conversations for hardcore, I, I, I'm right. emphasizing that, yeah. hardcore science deniers to give up their beliefs. So it, it is really a yeah. matter of talking and then, and then perhaps seeing um, what would happen, uh, you know, what, yeah. what if I mean, there could be a study on this, but to my knowledge, there is not one. There was a famously a study in 2019, which provided the first empirical evidence that you could convince science deniers to give up their uh, false beliefs, but it was not done face to face. It was virtual. 
-hmm. And it was not hardcore deniers. It was people who had just heard the miscommunication or the false information, and it was immediately debunked. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually wrote to the people who did that study and said, how about we do one face to face? And they were interested. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and we haven't gotten back to it yet. But that, that could be studied. And I, and I, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence um, to you know provide the basis for a good scientific hypothesis to do that, I think. Mm -hmm. You said you haven't followed up on that yet. And uh, maybe we can yeah. talk about that at, near the end, which will be yep. 2.30. So we have a, a sharp cutoff today and we'll mm -hmm. wrap up in time for that. Um, uh, your first chapter is about your encounter with flat earthers and, uh, you know, our our readers here and also uh, anyone that hasn't read the book yet and I uh, would recommend it. But there's a lot of uh, YouTube videos of you. Um, I, I thanked you already for writing this book and, and promoting this concept of opening doors and how to talk respectfully to people and so forth. Um, but also um, the idea of, um, you know, uh, going to these places, talking to them face to face, these uh, flat earthers. Um, you, you've described that in many of these other videos, and we can do that briefly if I can ask you sure. um, an unusual question. Sure. Um, yeah, first of all, I want to thank you for exploring that subculture, I guess uh, you call it. Um, I always you know, just assumed I didn't play, pay close attention to them. I just assumed uh, some of much of them were pranksters, but that's yeah, not true. They're not. Yep. And, uh, you know, or that, um, uh, you know, one of their um, beliefs is that there's a, a dome, if I'm remembering this correctly, yeah. over the flat earth and that uh, the stars and so on move on this dome is, is that it, it just outside the dome. Um, and it, this is why they also believe that we've never been to the moon. Um, and it, it's, I mean, think of a, uh, think of a snow globe, think of a terrarium, <laughs> right? That's what they think it's like. Um, which means that there's an edge to the flat earth. Why can't you fall off? Because there's a dome. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's something holding you back, something holding the water back. Actually, they think that what holds the water back is the uh, Antarctica, which is not a continent, but a mountain range around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. I have to say what I'm reporting to you here is was was the view of the folks that I met at the Flat Earth International Conference in 2018. Right. There are also other flat earthers, uh, notably the Flat Earth Society, that is different. And they sort of hate one another. Uh, it's kind of like the People's Front of Judea and the Judean People's Front. So it's um, easy as an outsider to, to ridicule this. And I could never quite figure out what the great bone of contention was between them. Yes. But since the Flat Earth International Conference people were conspiracy theorists, one hypothesis I heard is that the Flat Earth Society people were actually shills to try to make the Flat Earth community look stupid. Oh. Uh, so there are some, at least some of their beliefs that they don't share, mm -hmm. uh, but I could never figure out precisely what those were. Mm -hmm. uh, before moving on from the flat earth stuff, um, I did wonder, are they saying that this dome touches earth's surface at the Antarctic mountain range? Uh, I, I never, never got straight on that. Um, I think it, it would have to be just outside it i i don't know i i can't did you ever see the movie the truman show you know uh, he, he goes out in the water it. and then he gets to the edge and then you know oh here's the edge i mean they do think there is an edge mm -hmm. and they do think that the water can't go off the edge because of the mountains and i think yeah if you think of a snow globe i, I think it must be that the dome you know goes the whole way and sort of seals it in <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the here's one really interesting thing. If you talk to various people within the community, they will sometimes believe different things. So there, there are, but, but, they, but they all like one another. I mean, they all support one another. So there's, you know, it's not like you would expect there to be 
fractures within the community where, you know, there are, uh, you know, huge arguments about, you know, no, the dome is inside the mountains. No, it's outside the mountains. I didn't really hear any of that. Mm -hmm. And I almost chalked that up to the fact that they were so persecuted uh, for their beliefs that they sort of stuck together and uh, could tolerate the idea that there were different points of view within their community, as right. long as it wasn't anybody from the Flat Earth Society. Right. That made it. You said um, no amount of evidence will convince a denier. And um, my, my thought is, uh, wouldn't it be exciting to, um, you know, I, I think within some decades, maybe just a couple, um, there will be space tourists. And I can't, yes. I hope I live long enough or you know, obviously they go on airplanes, but that isn't the same. It's not, it's not the same. Look, don't get your hopes up because <laughs> um, my experience is that even when evidence slaps them in the face, they will not change their mind and they'll say, oh, well, yeah, but what about this other thing that they'll bring up? Uh, a great example, I was having dinner with one fellow um, who was a presenter on the stage yes. talking about how to get people into flat earth. And I asked him what evidence would convince him to change his mind. And he suggested going up in a rocket ship, mm -hmm. and, you know, which this was pre Elon Musk, pre, uh, you know, SpaceX, all of that. Mm -hmm. I did just, you know, buy a little, but, you know, no, we weren't going to be able to do that. But even without that, uh, even give it was the physical impossibility or the financial or whatever it was logistical. He said, no, uh, because maybe the windows would be curved. So even if he went up in the spaceship, you know, over, you only have to go up 60,000 feet. Some military jets can allegedly go that high. But right. you go up what that's called the Kármán line, or you go up 60,000 feet, you can see the curvature. Mm -hmm. um, would that convince them? I think not. Though some, there was a guy there who had a rocket ship and claimed that if he went up and saw that it was curved, he would come back down and tell everyone. <laughs> he tragically died in that rocket. I he went up 1,500 feet, which is not, I mean, that's not even taller than the world's tallest building, um, and uh, had a failure and fell to earth. <laughs> I wonder if there might be mental illness in some of these uh, cases, these, these um, folks. Um, for instance, the repeating theme of the CIA yeah. having mind control technology, embedding chips, using radio to control minds, that sort of thing. I definitely met people there that I would say had some sort of psychological or mental challenge. Yes. You know, one that springs to mind is the woman who told me that she was God. Um, so that exists. But I think we do a disservice to think that that explains the whole phenomena, yes. because then it's kind of like, well, we don't have to deal with it then, or that, you know, that explains it, that excuses it. Whereas I think it's actually much more insidious than that. Yes. There are probably certain psychological traits that predispose people to believe in conspiracy theories, and that's a big part of it. But that's a big part of any science denial. So unless we're prepared to say that, you know, all climate deniers, all anti-vaxxers, all anti-evolutionists are also mentally ill, I, I don't think we can get away with saying that. Um, to me, it seemed based on profound distrust and a sense of identity with other deniers. Right. And if that's mental illness, I think a lot of us are a lot more of us are mentally ill than we realize, right? Mm -hmm. Because the 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 weird feeling I got coming away from this is they're a lot like a lot of other people that I know. They're not that different. Mm -hmm. You could have a long conversation with the flat earther about something else and never even realize who you know what their beliefs were about the shape of the earth. Mm -hmm. So it is you're you're probably right empirically that you know if if you were to measure this that you know there are some people within the community who you know who are but is that a higher percentage than the general population i don't know if that's ever been studied right um there's a, there's a terrific book coming out um soon by ashley landrum who's a psychologist from texas tech uh, and the book is on flat earth and i can't wait to read it because she's a psychologist and 
she will probably talk about things like this but i haven't read the book yet because i don't think anybody has I'm not sure she's done with it yet <laughs> um one uh, thing that's so frustrating is when scientists are doing their work you know within their own um, methods and so on um, there are uh, ambiguous results in some cases mm -hmm. um, you know it, it, and especially you know like at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic and so forth and as you mentioned in your book denialists can exploit this uh, either consciously or just reacting to hey what what are the scientists telling us to do this week that sort of thing and yet yeah. that's the way science is, and especially with, you know, sort of a war time kind of situation like sure. we had three years ago with an emerging new uh, uh, pathogen. And um, I guess part of our communicating with everyone, including science deniers, is to emphasize what science is and, and that this is the sign of healthy science, perhaps. Yes. I, th I think that's right. I mean scientists do change their mind i mean what would you have them do right uh scientists i often want to say to a denier um as john maynard Keynes said when the facts change i change my mind what do you do sir right that's what scientists do um <laughs> science means being open to the evidence caring enough about evidence that when the evidence changes you change your theory now the problem is that to the lay public they don't think that's what science is they think that science is about proof and certainty. And I wrote an earlier book called The Scientific Attitude, where I took that conception to task and scolded scientists for relying on that, which they know is a myth, um, when getting attacked in public, you know, because then if the facts change, then it looks like you are a liar. Mm -hmm. So I think that the most extraordinary thing about science is the ability to uh, learn from evidence and change your theory on that basis, which means that you have to embrace uncertainty. And I think that message can work with the general public. I think that, you know, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I mean, everybody, they, they had their hands full because they needed everybody to get the message. Mm -hmm. This is what you need to do, right? But if you go in with that message, the persuasion, the convincing, the trust me, I'm a scientist message, it immediately get, makes people uh, uncomfortable, gets their back up. You know, why are you the expert? Why are you telling me what to do? And in fact, I think that it's been shown that a better way to handle that from a communications point of view is to embrace the uncertainty to say, you know, you're right to be skeptical. This is what scientists are skeptical all the time. Yes, but we, we, we measure things not against what we hope or think is true, but against the evidence. Right. And that's why we are today telling you to wear a mask, because we did a study in which we found, you know, X, Y, Z. And but here's what we still don't know. And but here's what we're doing about that. So I think a little bit of humility to embrace the idea of uncertainty can can really help because whether people trust science or not. I don't think many people understand the role of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. I think people think that scientists are geniuses, which sometimes they are, and they just know things that are, you know, provable, like it was, you know, one of, uh, uh, you know, postulates in deductive logic or Euclidean geometry. But that's not what science is like. And so part of it, this, I think, is to give the general public a better education in what science means. Mm -hmm. scientific reasoning um you've spoken in your book about how a lot of this is identity based and yes. my hope would be that more people who are not scientists and perhaps some who are scientists that aren't doing science well enough you know better than i do as philosopher of science that folks will take on the identity of someone who cares or perhaps obsesses about evidence yeah and then you overcome that pain uh, that most people have when they're confronted with uh, op opposite to their identity, opposite to their mm -hmm. cherished beliefs. The metaphor I would use is, and I'm going to do this later today, 
I'll be going to my gym and I will be lifting heavy weights and they're very painful, but I consider them productive, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we make our minds go through that same type of process yes. where we are become uh, actually the, the dopamine hit occurs when you solve a mystery genuinely, right? Uh, I like that. And, and uh, you, you get the denier hooked on that. Yeah. So my thought was, you, you described this in a very personal way. So I thought about it in a very personal way, too. You talk about talking face to face with people, listening carefully and so on. Uh, taking a denier on a skeptic's journey, such as solving a UFO case or a Bermuda Triangle mystery. Those are all sitting there waiting to be read mm -hmm. by folks or a magician showing how a psychic does their trick. Yeah. And then you get them hooked yeah. on, oh, I love seeing these mystery solves. And there's usually a little like, oh, that's so cool how yeah. we got fooled. And then you, they kind of internalize it. Because you, you want to be on the inside, right? I mean, that that's the cool thing. To, to Who wants to be a sucker? Who wants to be taken advantage of? Exactly. And Don't be fooled. It, if you think of it, deniers are... They, they do have some good instincts sometimes. Sometimes they're skeptical, though it's a little overactive and indiscriminate. Right. And sometimes they care about evidence. And if you could show how to channel that in the right way, that that might work. Now, again, I'm going to say here again, maybe don't get your hopes up because there's a there's a film called um, Behind the Curve about flat earthers and at the end they do a crucial experiment i mean bless them they do a crucial experiment this is a it's called the bedford level experiment and it's you know from history and it's a wonderful experiment to show that the earth is curved <laughs> and they think that it's going to show that uh, that it's not and they go out and they do the experiment pretty well and the result is not what they hoped for and what do they do Here's where, where they're not scientists. They don't live or die by the result of that experiment. They say, oh, well, we must have done something wrong. Uh, I don't tell anybody. Uh, that's, not, that's not right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's not appropriate. I like your idea very much about the toughening up aspect. And uh, one of my good friends, uh, Andy Norman, wrote a book called Mental Immunity where he argues that you can build up your mental immune system in the same way that you, you build up a physical immune system That's to true. ward off bad ideas. And he, he, he's a fellow philosopher, mind a friend of many years, and he calls this a new Socratic method. That's true. So that would, I mean, I, I highly recommend that book to people because it's, it's very much a self-help book, but it's kind of one of those, put your own mask on and then you can help others around you. Uh, uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. um, one of your references is the work of John Cook. He was one of our yes. speakers about a year ago, the concept mm -hmm. of pre-inoculation. Yes. So, um, the skeptic's journey I described earlier with, you know, magicians showing how psychics do their tricks and so on. Um, we skeptics, and I'm using the we as carefully as I can, where we have a, a years or decades of experience watching these um, same patterns unfold. And of course, I can't rule out that my biases are to expect to see that pattern, right? Yep. Yep. And science is, of course, designed to protect us using double blind experiments, randomized, so forth. And uh, again, you are the expert on that. I, I'm an amateur. Um, I, I hope not garbling the concept here. Um, I'm, I'm hardly an expert on that. But Oh, Go ahead. I, I guess I guess as a philosopher of science, though, Popper, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the the disproving. Uh, yes. Hypotheses yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's important. You know, just in the same way that I talked about how people have a misconception about the role of uncertainty in science. I think that a lot of lay people have a misconception about the role of skepticism. They sometimes believe that skepticism means not believing anything until there's proof. Right. Um, and now the irony there is that sometimes people who self-identify that way 
I think of them as having a double standard because they insist on a standard of proof for something they don't want to believe. But if it's something they do want to believe, they really don't need any evidence at all. So really, how skeptical are they? I mean, they've got the skepticism and the gullibility in the same hand. So right. they're not really that skeptical. Uh -huh. So, you know, because it, it's, I, I call them cafeteria skeptics, right? They're, they're, they're selective about what they're going to be skeptical of. Uh -huh. um, so that's, that's, you know, one problem. What they really don't understand, though, I think about skepticism is that the skeptic is willing to say in advance, if you show me this, I will change my mind. Which means that, you know, even if short of proof, because who has proof of empirical phenomena, the skeptic has a line to say, you know what, if you can show me evidence that's, you know, rises to this level, then my belief is justified, my belief is warranted. Maybe it's still incorrect. And maybe further evidence will show that it's incorrect. You know, skeptics are fallibilists, I guess. It's a, from philosophy, from, from Popper. They're fallibilists. So you can believe, you can be justified in believing that the world is a certain way because there's good evidence that it is. Yes, while holding out the idea that you could be wrong and that future evidence might prove you to be wrong. Isn't that just the best possible way to form beliefs about the empirical world? Because it means that you are insisting on a standard of evidence, but you're also open-minded enough to change your mind when the evidence changes. That's what deniers don't get about skepticism. Yes. They think that skeptics uh, never change their mind, or that you know that short of proof, why should you change your mind? But they they really are not understanding how scientists reason. And by the way, when I was at the Flat Earth Convention. That's what I talked to them about. I didn't go in there talking about Galileo and, uh, uh, you, you know, the uh, ships going hull down on the horizon or the superior mirage effect and all this, because they had read all that. They knew of what a Foucault's pendulum was. They, they had heard all the facts. Yes. What they were not prepared for is to have somebody challenge how they were reasoning about the facts. Yes. And that was what I really enjoyed as a philosopher. Yes. Um, I I did want to uh, in the half hour we have left kind of probe your your recommendations uh, and and see uh, how how they hold up if I may sure uh, in terms of um, your advice is to uh, have face to face conversations if possible one on one uh, yes. you know very um, time consuming. Um, <laughs> contact and then as you mentioned in your book you have to come back later too because yeah. eventually it fades they fall back into their fallacies um and, but that having said that yeah. you you've not just talked the talk you've walked the walk because uh if if folks and i highly recommend this please google uh, lee mcintyre deniers <laughs> and you'll get many, many, many YouTube video hits. You are out there, I mean, you know, from your home or wherever, mm -hmm. but also um, you went to Las Vegas for the Skeptics Convention last October uh, by the uh, uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and, um, you know, Center for Inquiry. And you gave your talk, uh, which is also mm -hmm. online, by yep. the way, I highly yep. recommend that. Um, so I, I did want to explore maybe finding more efficient ways uh, because you, although you're you're doing exactly yeah. what you're saying people should do uh, is is it enough? It, it's it's the hardest question really because it's it's not enough. But what other solution is there? I mean, if there were a scalable solution, I would be doing it. But uh, I mean, maybe there is one. I'm just not aware of it yet. My my goal has been to persuade to persuade the scientists and the allies of science that they need to do more face to face. Right. Um, that's where I think you know we can make the, the the most impact. If if everybody who believed in science grabbed an oar and started to paddle, we could we could have more of an impact on this. Right, especially um, if it's a coordinated paddling. And yes, your book, your, your book hopefully is, is the the conductor. The guy. <laughs> there, there, there are just 
But the reality is there are just no magic words that you can say. Mm -hmm. And so it means that if you're trying to perfect the right message, it, it's it, that's not going to work. What, what you need to do is think, think about the issue of trust. Mm -hmm. Who trusts you? Who can you meet and talk to and build trust with? That's the person that you're going to be successful with. Mm -hmm. And and here I I point people to the times when this method has worked, not just with science deniers like Jim Bridenstine. I tell the story about him in the book and mm -hmm. the vaccine deniers in Clark County, Washington in 2014. I mean, this method has worked mm -hmm. for deniers, but it's also worked for white supremacists. It's also worked to get people out of cults. And so, you know, there there is an amazing literature on the powerful effect of face-to-face -face respectful calm patient engagement with people who you disagree with mm -hmm. and how much of a difference that can make mm -hmm. and i i just don't think there's any substitute for that mm -hmm. what i'm doing is not enough but if i can convince more people to do the sorts of things that i talk about in the book maybe it would be enough Right. Because I th and in fact, I think the problem that we have right now is that a lot of people who believe in science suffer from something called the information deficit model, that you just need to go out there, tell people the facts, and if they don't accept it, walk away because you've done your job. Yes, but no, you haven't done your job. Um, it, it is actually possible to make a dent on this, and I wish more people did it. Um, people in the skeptics community are you're great start right to to do this i mean this is who my message is really supposed to resonate with because you're already out there take look you're taking the the telekinesis people seriously you're testing you know, you're okay, out yes. teams to, to study this. i mean taking it seriously in the sense that you're saying okay we're going to try to debunk you but that's taking them seriously and that's exactly what we need to do not just walk away and ignore them Mm -hmm. Before our video today started, I shared with you that I went to the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, convention um, yeah. in uh, Washington, D.C. last week. And um, one of the workshops I was in was science engagement with people of faith. Now, we our, our skeptics group is focused entirely on evidence based claims rather than faith based claims. Yeah. But there is so much familiar in the uh, booklet, and I'll post a link to this yeah. uh, from the AAAS uh, site, Scientists and Civic Life, Facilitating Dialogue-Based Communication. And just by coincidence, as I said a week ago, I was uh, in a workshop using many of the same techniques that you describe in your book. Okay. And this was aimed at professional yeah. scientists to go out in the community. And yeah. um, as you said, you, you don't just put facts out there and expect yeah. people to uh, react the same way a fellow scientist would um, in terms of, you know, how to process that information. Yeah, I didn't discover this. I mean, this has been out there and yeah. I'm just trying to channel that, that message to the people who uh, I think most need to hear it, but it's, uh, it can be very effective and uh, empowering. Mm -hmm. to the author of this, is Matthew Nisbet. He's professor of communication studies up in your area, Northeastern University. Mm -hmm. And he's also a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. So, you know, you open the front page of Skeptical Inquirer magazine, which is a great source of information, yes. obviously, for, yep. you know, they're at, it's out on the newsstand or loan your copy to a friend. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. There's other perspectives that are marginalized in the news media. Um, uh, as far as particular mysteries like these uh, Navy UFO videos and yeah. so on, and to, to give a, a more um, complete and um, rational um, discussion of these uh, topics. Um, I did want to float an idea I, uh, that wasn't in your book. Uh, mm -hmm. And what do you think of this? As, as you're saying, hey, this is a, a grassroots uh, person by person and then repeat, right? You know, yeah. to, in yeah. your case, you regretted not keeping in touch with some of these I folks did. so you could, you know, see how they're doing Made later. 
Yeah. And uh, how about this? Well-made videos starring an expert who speaks in a friendly, warm way, just as you describe uh, one-on-one, and then provides the steel person argument, you know, the opposite of straw man, where you're, um, you know, misstating, again, following your rules of, of capturing the other person's argument, hopefully with even better wording or whatever so they know you're listening and then explains the problems answers what have you um one that you mentioned in a note in your book bill nye the science guy used to be against gmos genetically modified organisms and then he changed his mind based on evidence and couldn't he make a video perhaps he has i'm not an expert on on bill nye's um you know work Uh, saying, hey, here's why I believed what I believe, and here's why I've changed my mind. And as you say in your book, trust, authority, you know, expertise, um, you know, obviously his background is as an engineer, and that's often used against him. But the idea of, hey, as a kid, I trust him, and I still do, and here's why he changed his mind, that may win over some GMO uh, skeptics uh, or deniers, perhaps. It, it, it could, and, and you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna say it can't work because I'm well aware of the following phenomena. A lot of people become deniers based on videos. You know, a, a lot of people that I met at the Flat Earth Convention if you talk, they, they're they happy. One of the icebreakers is the origin story. How did you become a flat earther? Mm-hmm. Uh, awful lot of people that I spoke with, they were watching YouTube videos mm-hmm. where they didn't think that flat earth was a thing. And they thought, oh, how ridiculous. I'm, and then they watch the video and they think, wow, I that seemed pretty compelling. I don't know what to say about some of those arguments. Oh, here's another video. And they click on the next one because well, you know what YouTube does. If, if you like that, it'll give you another. Well, after the 20th video, you're a flat earther. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if there were videos like that out there, which by the way, there are about flat earth, there are ones debunking flat earth out there as well. But, you know, well-made videos like the ones that you describe uh, could make a difference. I mean, I think we're in the kind of both and phase of this. We need to do everything that we can. But, but I'm going to say that there's no substitute for the face-to-face yeah, because... Yeah. Again, do you trust somebody more when you see them on a video or when you have a face-to-face conversation? Mm-hmm. The face-to-face, there's just something about human interaction that when you're having a face-to-face conversation with someone, you kind of like them a little more. It's Hopefully. hard to be, <laughs> well, it's hard to be rude. It's hard to be angry. It's hard. I mean, it. it, it yeah, hopefully you're right. But I mean, there were, I, I didn't know what it was going to be like for me going to the Flat Earth Convention when I went. Mm-hmm. But what I found was that the same social norms that I had about patience and respect, they sh- reflected back to me. And I think it's because it was a face-to-face conversation. We weren't anonymously posting something on, you know, the comment section of a Washington Post article. Mm-hmm. We were there having a conversation, understanding that we had certain things in common as a human being. Mm-hmm. The fellow who went up in the rocket, I met him. I sort of admired him. I mean, he was putting his beliefs on the line and he had an experimental attitude. So, you know, did we have something in common? Yes, we did. Mm-hmm. So there's something about human face-to-face interaction that is magical. And I'll say, you, so you're from the DC area. I've often thought that one way to reduce the polarization in Washington was uh, what was it Tip O'Neill's idea? I forget whose idea to make them all live in a dormitory together, uh-huh. you know, rather than all renting apartments. Because now you see somebody in Congress giving a speech and all the chairs behind are empty. They don't even listen to one another's speeches anymore. Right. What if they had congressional dormitories where they had to live? If you're a member of Congress, you're living in Washington, you've got to live in this dormitory. I think there would be a lot more friendships across the aisle. A lot more would get done. Interesting. I, I do think many of them watch, you know, C-SPAN is on in the congressional offices, um, mm-hmm. having been to many of them over my lifetime. Um, um, they're uh, watching, they're just not in their seat. Well, that might be. Uh, that, <laughs> that they're not constantly watching the C-SPAN yeah. feed, but uh, that it is on there and they do uh, have access and perhaps video um, 
looking back at what someone said or, hey, did you hear what so-and-so said? Yeah. But I, I like your idea of dorm living in Congress, although that could be a security issue. Uh, um, well, these days, yeah. Yeah. But I, I've got to look I, that up. I, I mean, that idea came from some politician in the 70s. I think it was Tip O'Neill. Interesting. That came up with, with that idea. You're, you've already answered one of our participants' questions. So uh, Melissa in Arlington, Virginia, said, you know, I'm on Facebook and I'm encountering deniers of different types. And you've already said, well, you can't beat face to face. And uh, I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, is there anything uh, not as effective as face to face, but is there anything that can be done in that environment or does that? Yeah, just an engagement. Problems? I mean, any kind of engagement is better than none. Mm -hmm. And Facebook or Twitter, you know, however you're in, engaging with someone, if they're reaching a hand out and you reach back, that's the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, it's possible. It is possible to build respect and, and you know, a certain amount of uh, uh, just human feeling even when it's video. I remember one time I was doing an event. It was a skeptic uh, a club. I forget which one. But in the middle of it, we had, I, I don't want to say it wasn't a troll. It wasn't you know somebody who wasn't supposed to be there, but it was somebody who was listening and all of a sudden just burst out furious, angry. You know, uh, I don't think he was cursing, but he was disrespecting me, calling me boy and such. I mean, it was awful. Wow. And... In the moment, and I don't want to make too much a big deal about, you know, my role in this, but in the moment, I just, you know, I was kind of so shocked, you know, this happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen often. And I just completely calmed down, was patient, talked slower, waited. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, he was calling me, sir. Cool. Now, I didn't do anything magic there. I just channeled the kind of... um you know, idea that, you know, if you show someone aggression, they'll show you aggression back. Now, I didn't change his mind. Uh, it was about vaccines. He was particularly upset. Mm -hmm. And I mean, look, in in my heart and soul, I wanted to say, yeah, I think you should be <laughs> vaccinated. Uh, and, you know, if you're, I mean, this was the height of the pandemic and, you know, his decision was affecting everyone else. But, you know, I wasn't going to say something to him like, yeah, I'd, you know, hold you down and vaccinate you. Uh, instead, you know, I would, I said, um, nobody is going to vaccinate you against your will. That's just, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be afraid of that. And that kind of calmed him down a little bit. And uh, there's so some mandated for like federal workers and things like yeah. that. He's, he, he was talking about that. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, it, it, actually, anyway, it was so I, it was possible. I mean, it proved to me that it was possible even. And by the way, his screen was not on. This was all audio. His yelling at me was all audio. That I couldn't see him. Mm -hmm. um, but we managed to build something between the two of us. I see. Even on the screen with no video. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, a quick comment about uh, mandated vaccines. It seemed to me, I, I, I wish that there had been some consideration, and maybe there was, and it just wasn't publicly uh, considered, of, listen, we don't have to have 100% of people um, vaccinated. Uh, let's have a lottery. And anyone who doesn't want to be vaccinated mm -hmm. goes in. And, uh, you know, if I, I don't remember what the numbers were, 80% uh, or something to get to herd um, uh, you know, uh, the I, I don't know. I mean, it, I'm always trying to think of a way that they could defeat that. I mean, what I've often perversely thought that what might have worked is say you can't get the vaccine. It's uh, no, we're we're saving the vaccine. Interesting. A little uh, manipulative. Uh, then, I think. Yeah, I oh, give it to me. Re reverse psychology, like yes, you, uh, reverse yes. psychology. Um, by the way. Uh, I, I really loved how you're very honest in your uh, approach, uh, as was this um, AAAS uh, publication I just mentioned. And I'm guessing even after is, this book has been out for a year and a half. Yeah. And uh, I, 
I assume no one has said, you know what, why didn't you include being deceptive? <laughs> I, I just saw that recently, uh, <laughs> a few weeks ago, and it was very effective for what was trying to be done, but I, I don't think it's good. I think it's, I, I think I'm with you in terms of, hey, let's yeah. be honest and 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 forthright and complete. That's not Actually, that's my next works, question about it works short, short term. Calls. Deception yeah. works short term for one thing, but then once they catch you, that's it. Right. I can tell you very quickly what it was. We only have 15 minutes left here, by the way. And that was um, a public figure said, oh, you were right. I shouldn't have gotten the jab, uh, the, the shot. Um, how did you know what... To, uh, I was wrong and you're right. How did you know uh, not to get the shot? Because I was weighing the safety of this new vaccine that was produced through unusual, you know, un unprecedented processes against long COVID. And so, and so he was asking, how did you know? And none of them could answer. They were, it was cognitive dissonance. They were uh, coming up with, oh, I'm a good pattern uh, recognized. And of course I'm, not being faithful to that, people would look at it themselves. Mm -hmm. Anyway, then he later said, "You know what? I, you, you know, I, I was just saying. You know, no, none of you could say it, he was deceptive by saying I, I believe you were correct, right? So that was yeah. not a great way of doing things. But it, people it, can it smell it if you're manipulative, right? Um, you just, you know, and, and it, I think you're right that being straightforward, which is different than saying everything on your mind all the time." But, you know, it helps. I mean, I would say to the flat earthers, look, I, on first day, I didn't say anything. But the second day, I said, look, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I, I, I don't agree with anything that you've said. I know you don't agree with me. Can we talk for a few minutes? Yes. Do you have a few minutes? And, and yeah. And they, and they were pleased to do this. Um, another quick idea, and that is, uh, as you know, for many years, very popular TV shows, these audition programs. So American Idol or a pen and teller fool us in a way, right? Mm. Uh, these other programs. What about a new type of program? Science debate. Well, well, don't shut me off. <laughs> but the idea of proponents and opponents or whatever, and they um, lay out their views, they rebut, they have excellent moderator. And um, people can watch these, you know, uh, uh, pros and cons uh, work themselves out and then maybe pick up another time. It's like, hey, I'll check on that uh, for the next time. And then just have a natural part mm -hmm. one, part two, a few days or whatever later. I, I think this could be very illuminating in terms of yeah. comparing and contrasting science versus non-science. And also uh, highlight, hey, we don't know this. We don't know this. And here's what we're going to do. Do you it's, think that might be, I, again, I'm trying to problem solve in terms of yeah. one on one is inefficient. Can we do better? If the only problem with that idea would be if you gave a platform to a denier where they seemed equal and they were up there on stage having a debate with the scientist so that some of the audience might come away with the impression that the denier had a good point, and then you're just amplified the wrong message. I'll, so, I'll suggest so a playoff. So you have the playoffs of the different uh, deniers, just like a sporting event, and you can watch these deniers, and someone will emerge from that, uh, presumably the least crazy or whatever. Well, like a, a Hunger Games for a uh... I, 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 that, that has some negative connotation. <laughs> right. <laughs> you have playoffs in the National Football League and so on. Yeah. And then and then you have the champion. Perhaps we'd also have playoffs for the scientists. So there would be superb communicators. I, I like that very much because right. there's some people who are really skilled at it. We saw this during COVID, right? There were certain people who convinced hundreds, if not thousands of people to get their COVID shots. There, there are, uh, you know, they talk about super spreaders, but there are super spreaders for truth too. Yes. You know, people who can uh, can do that. I, I like that. Uh, I like that very much. Yeah, I, by the way, I, I, I'll, I'll wrap up with, as we get into the news media, they haven't been helpful. They like clickbait. They um, 
omit things. That's there. Uh, many of our programs this season uh, have involved, you know, the news media and what they can do to improve. Why are they omitting particular information that would lead viewers or readers to a different conclusion and so on? But in, in this case, you just mentioned about helping people, you know, go get the vaccine. We had President Obama come to my town here. And, you know, there's a lot of people of color and so on that are underserved by the uh, vaccination program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And news media here didn't cover it. There was a tweet by the White House uh, Twitter uh, account. Uh, oh, President Obama visited Greenbelt, Maryland. That's my town here. And it, you wouldn't know that. There was a little thing, uh, you know, it, where it's like, hey, you know, people connecting with former President Obama, but if they knew about it, <laughs> you know, uh, to yeah. say, oh, another example, although this is a little peculiar, but President Trump would tell people, hey, go, uh, I, I got the shot. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't think it should be mandated, but I got it. And, um, and, and very few media outlets publicized this. So if they'd gotten that out there, Republicans would be like, hey, Trump got it. And of course, they may have their own decision about whether or not to imitate Trump. But right. um, so um, and I did want to say you, you describe people of in trust positions. So you develop trust mm -hmm. um, experts, um, you know, coming into uh, the public realm. And, you know, we skeptics as sort of a first approximation, an expert appears and um, we're like, well, this person or group of people probably know what they're doing. So we'll do what they say to a certain point or we'll hear them out and then kind of poke around the edges to see if something has been omitted or something like that. But it's it's awkward because to say let's trust experts is that a is that a misstatement of your perspective to tell people to trust experts i mean they have to and the truth is they do every day right but what uh, about they just they're today? selective it, it, here's an example and again i'm i'm acting in terms of sort of poking rather than asserting i i want to mm -hmm. be clear here but um think about um uh, one second here while I get myself. Um, uh, when you were on with Michael Shermer, mm -hmm. you claimed that climate scientists rein in each other, you know, like a horse yeah. on reins. Yeah. Yeah. But couldn't this profession be poisoned with groupthink? For example, who becomes a climate scientist? Couldn't we expect them to primarily be environmentalists? So they appear with an ideal, they perform with an ideological underpinning. Yes, and, and that, I mean, look, th that's the thing. The, the identity, the community, that, that can happen to all of us. Mm -hmm. that, that can affect our empirical beliefs, right or left, scientist or non-scientist. One hopes that there are guardrails and you know, breaks in place for scientists to understand you know, why that's not a good thing, you know, of course, human psychology, they're going to prefer their own theory, but they also prefer not to be humiliated in public. So they're, you know, not going to just assert that their theory is true unless they've got the evidence because somebody else will, uh, you know, will refute them. Yes, so, but you're bringing up something that's really important, which is that we all have cognitive biases yes, and we all need to be aware of the effect that they have on our on our thinking and again one of the one of the great things about science is that it not only tolerates but in some sense celebrates the gadflies mm -hmm. now then unfortunately that can be taken advantage of by people who are climate deniers say who who say oh yes but why aren't you paying attention to, you know, this particular Nobel Prize winning physicist who has no training whatsoever in climatology, you know, right. who's picking apart this, um, you know, this data. Um, and I strongly believe that science has to tolerate all comers. Mm -hmm. 
if they have the evidence. That doesn't mean that anybody can kick in the door and say, you have to pay attention to me. You have to look at my hypothesis and vet it because I think I'm right. Mm -hmm. You have to have the evidence. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, you know, people, skeptics will, or uh, skeptics, uh, deniers will sometimes complain that you don't have 100% consensus in science about the vaccines or about evolution or, uh, you know, about climate change. That, but you, you never have that. That's not what you need. Right. Um, it's not five just five denier characters. Yeah, yes. that's right. And and so I I think of a denier as somebody, not just who challenges the scientific consensus, but who doesn't have evidence for their alternative belief, mm -hmm. and who's not willing to say what evidence that you could produce to convince them that they were wrong. Mm -hmm. And no matter what the foibles of human reasoning. If you buy into what I call the scientific attitude, the idea that you change your mind when the evidence changes, right? then I think you've got a route to get out of that. Because it's not like we've got cognitive bias and that's destiny. We've got cognitive bias and we need to attend to it and figure out how to overcome it. And there are tools to do so. Mm -hmm. And the scientific attitude is, I think, one of them. And I would like to see much more science education about that, mm -hmm. not just about um the results of science not science appreciation but talk i was just thinking about this the other day but why couldn't you teach how scientists reason to fifth graders yes why couldn't you teach what it means to have evidence for a hypothesis mm -hmm. um you know at a very young age mm -hmm. so i'm I, I i really like that you're pushing me on this idea that it doesn't my modality is one to one but why couldn't you have a teacher who was, you know, up on this methodology teaching a whole class of kids? That's not one to one, but could that work? Yes, it absolutely could work. Excellent. If that could work, could you have videos? You know, yes, let's expand this. Let's have more. But but what we need first is more people recognizing that science denial is a problem. Yes. And that there's something that each one of us can do about it. In our couple minutes left, uh... A quick comment, please take this in a constructive criticism. Sure. And that was, um, you uh, noted that, uh, you know, there's a connection between a 1952 meeting about the tobacco industry um, yep. and, and distorting science on tobacco safety, you know, going all the way through the 2021 attack on the Capitol. It, yep. it, that, that sentence seemed a bit of a stretch, you know, as a skeptic. Okay. But um, I would say other examples predate that. The Tuskegee syphilis study mm -hmm. by the U.S. Public Health Service came to mind immediately. Yes. Or, um, so you know, there you have scientists, you know, failing uh, ethically, failing, uh, you know, their duty as scientists, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hippocratic oath and so forth. Um, listen, in our minute uh, remaining, uh, your book came out a year and a half ago. You've been interacting with the public just as you say you should. By the way, lead by example is a wonderful way to persuade. And I'd love for scientists, this AAAS meeting was here in DC. Let's make it virtual instead of people flying to a climate science <laughs> convention mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, lead by example, here's how to reduce our carbon footprint and still get what we want. But anyway, any news since your book came out like that? That study you were thinking about doing with I, I forgot her name, but uh, Cornelia Bache and uh, Philip Schmidt. Yes, I I need to contact them. I have been tardy in uh, in doing this. I've been so busy with uh, uh, publicity and working on the next book that I I haven't followed up on that. I I there's another there's another study that I'm working on that I it's a little bit of a, a secret right now, but I'm working with a a psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I do need to get on that. And thanks for the prod. Uh, to remember to do that because I think that now that we, we're just what as of tomorrow passing the three-year anniversary for the original lockdown and the pandemic okay. I think it's probably time that we can do an experiment uh, mm -hmm. a, a scientific experiment to test this idea and I, I know just who to call mm -hmm. and you mentioned your next book uh, the title and, and and more about it would you yeah the next book is called on disinformation 
and the subtitle is how to uh, how to fight for truth and protect democracy. Mm -hmm. That's where I draw that connection that that you uh, very wisely question because people should between the 1953 meeting of the tobacco executives at the Plaza Hotel in New York and you know how they were going to help through a public relations campaign to show that um, we could be skeptical that smoking caused lung cancer. And of course, it was all smoke and mirrors. Ha ha. They did it for profit. Mm -hmm. I think there's a straight line between that and the propaganda campaign about election denial mm -hmm. that led to January 6th. And the secret sauce there, the connection, is you mentioned John Cook earlier. His work on Flick, on the five different tropes of science denial. If you look at those five different tropes, they are identical to the ones that are used in the uh, Trump's disinformation campaign about election denial. And so the book is about bringing the science denial paradigm over to reality denial and what that would mean. And it's about not just dealing with people once they believe the falsehood, but how to keep them from um, hearing the falsehood in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the book is called On Disinformation because the update is denial doesn't just come out of nowhere. Right. A lot of denial comes from disinformation, which is intentionally created falsehood that someone puts forward for their own benefit. Yeah. The believers become victims. That's and right. That's the update to the story yeah. that I'm so excited about. Yeah, the, the news media omitting things where it's like, just keep the video going and people come to a different conclusion. It's or, or uh, other aspects uh, that are undue emphasis or de emphasis of particular yes. uh, facts in a case and so on. I, I have a lot to say about that. In, in the new book, because, you know, the, the, look, again, I don't want to cause false equivalence here. Right. What Fox News did recently is outright lying. It's the most disingenuous sort of thing where you know something isn't true, but you say that it's true. Are you talking now, about the hidden the, uh, texts and so on that came uh, out? No, I'm talking about the uh, the idea of the uh, um, about the election denial that, you know, the hosts uh, knowing that what they were saying was false, or at least let me put it this way, they didn't believe it. Mm -hmm. They went ahead with it. Um, and then something else that MSNBC, for instance, is often criticized for, which is you know framing a narrative that they want and then cherry picking the facts to fit it. Yes. That's also a very bad thing for journalists to do. They're not the same, right? It's, it, it's worse to outright lie to your audience than to cherry pick facts for a, a narrative that is misleading. But it is, they're both bad. And I take both, uh, I take really all of the news media to task yes. in the book about that, because I think that really the, the, to give away the story in the, in the book is the real problem is the amplification of disinformation. Mm -hmm. And the media has really done a horrid job yes. uh, on this. They're, they're, they're part of the problem yes. uh, it, with this. The, the, the best consumers can do, and this isn't good enough, not even close, is to watch both. So if you watch Fox mm -hmm. and MSNBC, typically they won't leave both thing, uh, the same things out. There could be cases where they would do that. Well, but, uh, but you're getting some disinformation in there that's too, correct. though. You'll have be to. Be best source I've ever found is the BBC. I agree, especially because they really don't care about American exactly. uh, sensibilities. They're going to tell you uh, what you need to know. <laughs> yeah, I, I said so um, uh, during um, we had a Columbia School of Journalism professor on um, back in October. And uh, I noted the same thing that BBC News, especially their American political coverage. Yes, they're excellent. Under they, the circumstances, it's they, the best we can do. I uh, think that's right. Thank you so much for spending your time. I've kept you a little past our... That's okay. I really appreciate you going that extra, not just today, but uh, your extra mile getting this word out to scientists, to teachers, to skeptics, uh, volunteers like myself and, and the rest of the National Capital Area skeptics, trying to get the word out to people and uh, make their lives better. Um, among other things here. Thanks for the work you're doing too. This is important.
Thank you. And folks, be sure to visit his website, leemacintyrebooks.com, one word, uh, leemacintyrebooks.com. And I'll say that today's program was produced, as always, excellently by J.D. Mack. Thanks, J.D. Thank you. On behalf of the National Capillary Skeptics, I'm Scott Snell signing off from Greenbelt, Maryland. Please join us again. Date, time, speaker, subject, unknown, except perhaps to genuine psychics, which we don't believe exist. So anyway, we hope to see you. Check ncas.org as uh, things develop, uh, hopefully. Uh, Lee, thank you again, and you have a good day now. You too. Thank you both for having me. I appreciate it. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.